And now I'd like to introduce to you our hosts, Tom and Dave. Hello, um, I'm David Carter. I'm the STEM training director for Vernier and I'll be helping out with this workshop. Um, I've been using Vernier products for over 30 years. Uh, I got my start when I ran the instructional physics labs at the University of Mississippi and using early Vernier products a long, long time ago. So I've taught college physics, taught middle school, done a lot of uh, teacher workshops over the years. So that's who I am. Uh, I'll let Tom introduce himself. Hi, uh, Tom Smith here. I am a uh, part of the technical support team here at Vernier. We uh, are the people who answer the phone when you call up with a question or a problem to solve. Uh, we do some uh, uh, curriculum development and new product development as well, kind of a variety of different things and uh, help out with training whenever we can. Um, I'm a, a former physics and engineering teacher at the high school level. I spent about nine years in the classroom before joining Vernier. Dave, were you gonna show them a bit of the remote learning uh, resource? That's the plan. So what we're gonna do, let's see, we've, several of you have taken the poll there. It looks like we've got the majority are high school um, physics there. We got some college, um, let's see. Um, about 60% so far are online, some are hybrid, and um, it looks like several people have downloaded that uh, uh, Vernier graphical analysis. So um, I'm, I will end that poll there. Um, and um, so let me, uh, let me do this. Um, so what I would like to do is we're going to start off with just a, a quick sharing of a screen from our website that talks about some of the um, resources that we have for remote learning. And it ties into what we're going to be doing today. So um, the, the lab, Tom's going to be doing most of the work in terms of, of the labs he's going to be sharing with you. But I want to show you where those come from and, the, and those resources. And so that's what we're going to be doing now. So what I want to do is share um, the the website there, oops, let's see. So you should be seeing um, the, uh, the Vernier website there. Um, and um, so I'm just at, at the, the homepage here and right at the very top, there is a part that says explore remote solutions. And, you know, back last spring when things all of a sudden got really strange for everybody. Uh, we were like, what can we do to help out? And so we, we started working with this. And so we, we created this part of the website uh, for, with some resources here. Um, and it breaks it up by K-8 college and high school, um, kind of gets you down a different path. I'm just gonna go down the, the high school path here. Um, and there are several things that are here that are very useful. Um, one, um, there is a link to our Vernier Graphical Analysis Pro software. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about it. Um, and that was a link that uh, was in the, the chat document and in some of the uh, emails that you got uh, before coming to this. Uh, something about uh, the new uh, Vernier Graphical Analysis Pro. So we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, a little bit later. Um, the uh, Vernier video analysis. I know Tom's going to be doing some work with that. Um, some of you may be familiar with Pivot, um, and there have been some other Pivot webinars, and so that's another resource that's, that uh, you might check out here. Um, but what I'm going to go, we're actually going to start off here with this um, analyze data at home. So what we've done is create a library of experiments where we have the data and the actual experiments um, for download for free. And the idea is that maybe you're teaching uh, remotely and you would like your students to actually analyze real data from an experiment, but you don't have your own data to be able to do it. And so we've put up the data there so that you can be able to do this. And uh, so I'm going to go here to, uh, to view the library. And so um, if I'm going to go here and say browse library, what you'll see is um, a list of all the different experiments that are there. And by default, when you click on it, uh, it, it goes straight to the biology tab. So there's a chemistry tab and a physics tab. And uh, so what it does is that what you'll see is a list of the various lab manuals from which these uh, labs were drawn. Um, it lists next to it uh, the software that's used in that particular data file. 
Um, and then in some cases, there may be a video that goes with it that explains what the lab is about. So depending on um, what's there. Now, you can actually download all of, of this as a big document if you want to, or if you just go and you choose the, the lab you want to look for, uh, you can actually go and, and, and choose it from that, that particular list though. So I know that like for today, um, we are going to be doing, um, Tom's going to be starting off with, with experiment 20 from our physics with Vernier book. It's the centripetal um, motion on a turntable. And uh, so if we click there, what it does is it takes you to a, a Google Drive where you can download um, and the labs there. And uh, so, you know, again, what you get are the data files for that particular lab based on the software. Now, we're going to be doing this in using the graphical analysis software. And most of you, when you look at those files in that library, you're going to see that the majority of them actually are for graphical analysis because it's a free, it's free app. So you can download that. And then you also get the doc files for the lab. So it's actually part of the manual. So you can actually download the manuals and, um, and it is a doc file. So you can even modify it if you wanted to, but that's what you're getting there. Um, and uh, so it's a really nice resource. And there are, I'm not sure, I know there's over 300. I'm not sure that the total number now, but uh, there are lots of different files there and they're gonna be available for some time. That's been a question for people who've asked like, how long is this gonna be available? Cause it is free, um, you know, as long as it needs to be, um, you know, as we're running virtual and all of that, we want to make sure that uh, we've got that there. So, um, and so that's where these things are coming from. Um, and we got that. So uh, let's see here. We've got a, uh, um, oh, somebody asked a question here um, and I'm going to answer it now. So somebody's asking about um, putting uh, graphical analysis on Chromebooks. Um, uh, there's really not a problem with putting it on a Chromebook. So graphical analysis, it's available for five platforms. So Mac and PC, iOS, Android, and Chromebook. Um, and so it is a, it goes right on the Chromebook. Um, and so it, it works there just fine because uh, basically it, it, you know, it, it is designed to work on all of those different platforms. Um, and as long as the device has a modern browser on it, then that's the way it works. And so, um, you know, I guess the issue might be if your school had something set up where they don't allow this, you know, the students to install a particular app without permissions or something like that. But that's the, other than that, there's really not a, a problem with that. So. Okay, well, I'm Dave, gonna do... I, let me interject here for a second yeah. um, uh, and just point out that there are links to the appropriate web stores when you go to look at graphical analysis on our website. Um, that will prevent you from going to, say, the, uh, the Play Store to get the app that you may, you may end up with the wrong application on a Chromebook if you try to go that, mo uh, that route. So it's always best to go to our website, go to the graphical analysis page, click on the link to the appropriate web store. Get you where you need to go, so. Yep. Okay, well, Tom, are you ready to, to take over with the, the actual physics part of this? I think I am, let's see. Okay, well, let me stop sharing my screen so that you can take over there. Okay, so uh, as Dave mentioned, we're gonna start off by looking at the, uh, the experimental data files and running through this uh, centripetal acceleration on a turntable lab uh, uh, from the data that's available through that experimental uh, data file. I'm also going to uh, take a look at how you might enhance that learning uh, for your students by using the video analysis app and, uh, and then look a little bit at the graphical analysis pro options for either completely doing the lab through graphical analysis pro or or just enhancing that uh, that experience for your students um, for the most part i'm going to be just sharing my screen uh, so i'll uh, i'll go to that uh, here in just a second i will note before i do that though that you know we're we're trying to provide you with some tools to use in this kind of strange teaching time and I have never taught remotely before, so I, I'm giving some ideas that are not tested. And I would encourage you guys to use the, 
the Q and A in the uh, in the Zoom meeting to uh, provide suggestions to your colleagues out there, uh, as well as to comment on how you might use this uh, in your classroom uh, in your particular scenario. With that, let me start sharing my screen. Start with you. There we go. So we should be seeing uh, my 1979 vintage techniques turntable and uh, graphical analysis uh, up on the screen there. Um, so the, the lab, just to kind of set the stage a little bit, uh, basically is looking at um, what is the uh, this this circular motion all about? And if I put uh, uh, our Isaac Newton on the scale on the turntable and turn it on, we can see that there's something that's keeping him from going in a straight line. Uh, we can certainly uh, speed that up and think about, okay, is that uh, force of friction that's holding him in place? Uh, greater or less than at that at that speed. Uh, so that's kind of what we're exploring. There's some preliminary activities in the lab that you can run through with your students. And I think uh, one of the one of the ideas I've had about how to uh, run this lab in a remote learning situation is to engage uh, to a certain degree these preliminary activities and uh, and even some of the first steps in the lab uh, as a class uh, in a Zoom setting or, or whatever the platform is that your school is using. And then uh, at some point, uh, you're going to uh, uh, set your kids free to go and, and complete the analysis portion of the lab on their own. And the nice thing is that they all have access to that data through these uh, external data files. Um, I guess you could simply, uh, you know, send that uh, that student handout and the the three data files for this lab, and give that to them and say, "Go do it." In which case, this would be a really short webinar. But uh, we're going to play around with a few other options to kind of en enhance that a little bit. So uh, the first step in the lab is actually. Uh, getting familiar with the uh, the sensor that we use in the lab. Um, this is the sensor here. Sorry for the upside down view of my camera, but, um, and we're gonna put this on the turntable and we're gonna orient it so that, uh, I don't know if you can see, I'll try to make this visible for you. On the face of the sensor, there is a, a coordinate system, an X, Y, and Z axis this is a go direct sensor and it has a three, a three uh, axis accelerometer built into it. Uh, so we'll take a little bit of, of time to look at this in graphical analysis uh, as well, but just wanted to show that to you. Um, I have set up my turntable with a, a radial stripe on it that's marked for distances. And uh, I've also uh, created a little stripe for my sensor that I can line up with that Y axis on my accelerometer. So forgive me while I fumble around here ever so slightly, there we go. Now when I get into the lab itself, I can just kind of set that on that stripe, line that up with that radial, and I know that my Y axis is pointing towards the center of the turntable. As I mentioned before, the first part of this lab, I think is useful to do uh, just kind of as a class experience. And it's all about understanding how this lab, uh, or excuse me, how this sensor functions, what happens when it is sped up in the direction of the arrow, and what happens when it slows down in the direction of the arrow. Try to get a sense as to what that positive acceleration might mean. Um, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead in uh, graphical analysis and I'll just start a new exper experiment so we can see how this looks. We have our sensor data collection, which is what we're going to do. Uh, some data sharing options, uh, if you're using this with a LabQuest two or three, 
Uh, you can do manual data entry as well, but we're gonna do, again, uh, sensor data collection. I've turned on my sensor so that the LED for the Bluetooth is uh, flashing red and the software is searching for the sensor. It's found it. I can do the proximity connect and it'll just find the closest sensor. I can just, if it's in my list, connect uh, like this. If I have several sensors available, uh, which usually is the case here at Vernier, but uh, uh, since all of our tech support are working from home, uh, I have the only sensor in the immediate range here that's turned on. And uh, I could filter it by the serial number, but I'll just go ahead and hit connect because I can see it. It's uh, pretty obviously right there. And you'll notice, you know, put this up here so we can see it. The LED should be flashing green now and I have it connected up here in the software. This is the list of channels that are available, the individual sensors that are built into this one device. So there's three axes of acceleration, there's three axes of high acceleration, so a different scale. Uh, there's a gyro built in as well as altitude and angle. We really just want the x-axis acceleration, so I'll click on that and deselect the x-axis and hit done. So uh, I'll bring this back down on the table. I'm gonna get this set up so that my uh, y-axis is facing along the direction that I'm going to be pushing it in that direction. And uh, I want to zero my sensor to get started. This is set up for 60 seconds for a data collection, which is probably quite a bit more than I'm gonna need. So I just clicked on the mode and I'm gonna change that to, well, rather than scroll down, I'll just select uh, six seconds. That ought to be plenty. I hit done. And now my scale is set to six seconds. I have y-axis acceleration on my axis. I'm ready to collect data. So I'm just gonna hit collect and then I'm gonna push it and let it stop. Not crazy about that data, so let me try that again. Collect. There we see a little bit better. In the student handout, uh, there, the, the preliminary activity around this has a couple of questions. And what I've done here for this demonstration today is I've just pulled out the data table for the student uh, section and I've put it uh, just in a Word document here. So the question is, when, when it's speeding up, when I've given it that shove, what direction, what type of acceleration is that? And I can see that I get a positive acceleration at, during that range. And when the sensor is being slowed down by uh, still moving in the positive direction, but slowed down, uh, I get a negative acceleration. So I can just put negative in here. And then the, the question that is kind of uh, behind these two observations is, okay, if, if I have some acceleration in the positive acceleration in the direction of the arrow, uh, that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna show up as a positive acceleration. Let me say that differently. If I'm accelerating in the direction of the arrow of the y-axis, that's gonna show up as positive uh, acceleration. So your students might write in here, acceleration in the direction of the arrow reads positive when speeding up, something like that, okay? That's really the first activity. You don't even need the, uh, the data set from, uh, from uh, the experimental data, but let me just show you that uh, so that you can uh, see that particular data set as well. In this case, I'm gonna choose a file rather than uh, uh, start a manual file. And I happen to have this one queued up. This is my uh, part one here. And I'll just hit open. And you can see, again, as you 
as you accelerate it in the positive direction, you get that positive acceleration. As it slows down, you get that negative acceleration. So a student could make this observation if they understood what was happening uh, in the experiment. Okay, um, the next part of the lab really deals with um, setting your sensor on the turntable. Again, I'm gonna line it up so it's aligned with one of those dots. I know the distance there. Um, I can uh, turn on my turntable. Hopefully I have tested this out enough in advance so that my accelerometer will not fly off the turntable when I turn it on. Okay, so um, if uh, so this second part of the lab, we're going to look at what is the acceleration? Is it positive or negative? And is that acceleration, uh, does it increase or decrease uh, as you uh, uh, increase that? the speed of the turntable from 33 and a third RPM to 45 RPM. If you happen to be fortunate enough to own one, a turntable that has uh, 78 RPM, you get an extra data point in that, in your table. So I'll set it at 33. And uh, let me again connect to my uh, sensor here. So I'm gonna start a new experiment. Sensor data collection. It remembers my sensor. Let's just make sure I'm connected to it. That's good. And then I want to, because uh, this is not zero, I just want to click on this and zero that sensor. Okay. And now uh, we're at 60 seconds. That's probably a good uh, amount of time for this. I can always. Uh, uh, stop the data collection sooner if I want to. I just realized that one thing that is maybe helpful for you right now and helpful for your students in the future is to increase the size of the font in this graph. So I can come up here to three dots, click on the presentation mode, and let's just increase that a bit so that we can see that a little bit better as I'm doing this demonstration. Now we have a little bit larger font in all of our axes and numbers and letters. Okay, so uh, I'll go ahead and hit the collect button. I'll just go ahead and start the motion on my turntable, get a bit of data. While this is happening, I can come down here and hit that so I get a little bit better uh, sense and then I'm going to increase the velocity now to the 45 rpm. Fortunately my sensor is staying intact there that's great. just want to get maybe another 10 seconds worth of data and then uh, I can turn my turntable off and let it slow down. I can stop my data collection now if I want to there's no harm in doing that so I'll just hit stop. Once again, I'll use the magnifying glass to kind of zoom in on the data. And then what I want to do is capture this information right here, this uh, acceleration and the acceleration over here uh, for these two uh, rotational rates. And in my data table, uh, I would want to know what that radius is at that point. And so I could uh, I could measure that. I happen to have I happen to know that uh, each of those dots that I placed on there is two centimeters from the center. Um, the whole turntable has a diameter of uh, thirty centimeters, um, so I should be able to figure out uh, what that is. Let me just uh, rip my ruler off just to uh, make my point here. I can. Take that off of there. Uh, have it lined up with that point. That's 12 uh, centimeters there. So in meters, which is what we're measuring these in, I want to put 0.12 for my radius. And then uh, in order to capture this data, 
we can scroll across a representative section of data, go to my graph tools, uh, look at uh, my statistics, and then pull off the mean values. So 1.41 meters per second squared is going to be my uh, acceleration uh, 1.41. And uh, we'll look down here at the 45 here in a second. So I'm going to scroll across there for a representative selection of data, view my statistics again, and we get 2.858. 2.58 here. 2.58. And we don't have a 78 setting on there. So that's, that's the data collected for, uh, for part uh, two. Um, needed some measurements from my turntable to make that happen. I'll just show you quickly the, uh, the file uh, in the data set. So I want to go to choose file. And save that. Look at this second uh, data set here. And we, again, uh, for this experiment, uh, Dave Vernier put in the distances that he measured for the sensor. So his sensor was 8.8 .8 centimeters from the center. Um, ours was at 12. Um, so we could actually, we could, if you wanted to, include uh, two more data points at different radiuses, but that's really not what we're about in this part of the experiment. We're still looking at you know, 33 and a third RPMs and 45 RPMs. Okay. So that's the, the data collection. Um, I'm gonna uh, uh, take just a moment and uh, look at the lab itself. I do this just to see if there was uh, any type of sometimes in the instructions for the uh, performance of the lab, the procedure, there's a, a kind of a question embedded in that. And uh, at this point, there, there really isn't. The questions are going to show up in the analysis part. So we've, we've collected the data that we need to collect for this at this point. The, um, the last portion of the lab, the third part of data collection, is to uh, collect, um, get that out of the way, is to collect data as we are moving the sensor uh, closer and closer and closer to the center of uh, the uh, turntable. We already have one data point at, for this. We're going to use 45 RPM for our, uh, our angular velocity for this. And then uh, we can, if I was doing this in a class, I would probably, uh, uh, I would probably demonstrate this once for them, but then send them to the experimental data. Um, that, I'm just remembering that there was something I wanted to, to show you and prompt you as a really valuable tool for uh, when you're uh, working with students who uh, are working remotely and having maybe a hard time engaging with the material. Um, is embedded in this uh, software is this tool to add a prediction. So if you think back to that first activity we did where we just pushed the sensor you might, before you even do that or introduce that idea, um, introduce the idea, but then have them go ahead and add a prediction to their, uh, to their graph. So in that case where they were pushing the sensor, they may come up with something that looks like this. Oops, not like that. We'll cancel that option. Let's see if I can work my mouse. Evidently I can't. Huh, let me try that one more time. Add prediction, and here I go. This is my prediction. This is what it's going to look like. 
And then that prediction will stay there as we collect data and they can see whether their prediction was legitimate or not. Uh, you could even put them in a breakout room to have a discussion with some of their peers about what that prediction is going to be. Uh, bring it back together for a class discussion before you actually uh, conduct the activity. So I'll uh, cancel that for now. Um, in this, uh, so let me start a new experiment. And uh, I'll back this up to just one step closer. So that should be 10 centimeters on that. Looks like I'm fairly well lined up on the radial axis there. And uh, I want to go ahead and zero my sensor again. So I have a clean start. And then uh, we're just gonna collect data for probably 20 or 30 seconds is gonna be more than enough. Um, I'll hit 20 there, say done. And then uh, I can uh, have it already set on 45 RPM. I can hit collect and start the revolutions there. And we'll get you know a good 15 seconds of data to work with. I can stop it early if I want to. And I go ahead and stop it now. Um, I can take a look at what that is. And, you know, at the end of this, we're going to have uh, several data points of, uh, on the turntable at uh, different radius. And I don't want to lose track of what that is. So I can open up the table view, the data table, and uh, I can expand this so I can see it a little bit better. And for uh, my acceleration, I'm going to uh, change my column options so that I just rename this as uh, put a, an added piece of information. This is at 10 centimeters and hit apply. And then I have that data locked in at 10 centimeters. When I go back to I'll stop the rotation now um, and close the data table. So I'm just looking at the graph. When I go to the next step, this is another place where it'd be interesting to have a discussion with your students. Okay, I'm closer to the point of rotation. Is my acceleration going to be greater or less than what it is now? And uh, you could just have a class discussion you could, uh, you know, again, break out into small groups or something like that, uh, or even create a poll and have them weigh in on what they think. And then uh, we can, again, get ready to collect data. It's already set there. I just need to hit collect and start that up. Same angular velocity, different radius. And again, I'll just stop it now. Now we just have one data set here. First of all, let's go back and rename this one. Get my data table present. And for data set two, I guess I could have renamed the data sets too, or instead of the, but I'll just keep on what I was doing here. So this is, oh, uh, my, my apologies. Uh, so once I've set up my Y acceleration, I really do need to, to change the data set name. So let's do that, rename the data set. We'll call that uh, uh, 10 centimeters. And then we'll rename data set to eight centimeters. And you could go on like this, just so that you have them renamed. I might actually go back in here and change this so that it's not confusing to you or me there, so that it has the right title. 
Okay, so there we have our additional data. Um, let's uh, click off the data table, close the examine tool. And in order to see both of those, uh, sorry if that's making you dizzy, uh, together, I just click on the Y axis here, click on uh, what is making me dizzy, the eight and 10 centimeter uh, data sets, and then you can see them both. And we can even put a, uh, a graph legend here so we can tell which one is which by the color of the graph. So we can see that. And again, uh, in, in the lab, I'll show this with the experimental data set. You're gonna take a look at those accelerations and you're actually gonna plot them against the radius to see what that relationship looks like. Okay, so uh, let me just pull up the uh, experimental data so we can take a look at that. Choose that file and open up part three. And he puts a note in here. There are five runs here with different radii. Uh, we can choose them all if we want to just get a sense for what they are. Um, I would include a graph legend for this as well, just because it helps us figure out what's going on here. And that's, that's the data that are collected. Now uh, we have a couple of things that we need to do to complete the lab. So we have our, all of our data kind of explained. Uh, if you've gone through this much of an explanation with your kids at this point, the, the analysis part is what's left for them. So the, uh, the lab instructions would have us, uh, first of all, uh, back in part two, where we looked at the angular velocity and the centripetal acceleration for those uh, two data points. They want us to graph those. And so I'm gonna go and create a new experiment, not save, and do manual data entry. I'm gonna pull back up my data table that I wrote down these values in. And uh, we can make this a little bit larger so we can see it and bring the data table into view. Um, on my x-axis, I'm going to uh, change the title to be uh, my uh, angular speed. Put units of radians per second. And then hit apply. And then for my x axis, for my, I'm going to look at the centripetal acceleration. And that has units of meters per second per second. Put that in there. Uh, the instructions actually give some guidance about this. We'll go into that here in just a second. But the question I would pose to my students would be, okay, we have these two, uh, two data points. Is it reasonable to include uh, a data point of zero uh, radians per second or revolutions per minute? And what is the corresponding acceleration with that? And I think that's a reasonable kind of uh, extreme, uh, uh, extreme points uh, conversation to have so that they could in fact include uh, zero and uh, zero as their first data point. Uh, then we can just pull off the, uh, you'll notice that they need to convert this into radians per second. I've done this earlier, so let me just throw those numbers in there. Or nine, I can avoid being dyslexic. The angular velocity, uh, from, from my previous data set, allow me to, to go there, is uh, 0 0.99. And this is just to make sure that I'm working with data that corresponds with what you're gonna see in the experimental data. 1.976. 
So if we look at performing a, a curve fit for this, you can pretty easily see that a straight line is not a great fit. The instructions actually guide the students to square the angular speed. So, um, so let's go ahead and, and go through that exercise. In order to create a calculated column in the data set, we click here, we'll go and we'll raise the second power. This is radians per second. Uh, raise the second power. And then my ex expression that I'm going to use is just ax to the b, where parameter a is 1, and my second parameter, which is the square. And I can apply that. And now in my graph, I can choose to have this angular velocity squared versus angular velocity. I can apply a curve fit, and I can look at the slope of that line, uh, notice that 0.888 is the slope of that line. Um, if we, and this is from, from the data set, uh, uh, from the experimental data set. If we go back and look at the, uh, at that particular, so remember this number, 0.0888. If we go back to that experimental uh, data set, looking at part two, and uh, we can see that we're 8.8 .8 centimeters from the center. That is 0 0.088 meters. So that, that activity is designed to help them get a sense that the uh, angular, excuse me, yeah, the angular velocity is uh, proportional perhaps to the radius and to the square of the angular velocity. And then they go about confirming that by looking at that third data set. I'm uh, recognizing that we're, we're a little, uh, we're running up on some time and I want to leave uh, some uh, opportunity to explore a couple of other uh, uh, resources that can help with this um, with this activity. Uh, let me pause for just a second and see if there are any questions in chat or the Q and A that need uh, addressing. Yeah, Tom, there's a question about doing it with a uh, WDSS, the Wireless Dynamic Sensor System. So I'm going to answer this live. And the answer is yes, you can do this with the Wireless Dynamic Sensor System, um, since it is an accelerometer also. And Dave, um, can you remind me, uh, are we able to connect the WDSS in uh, graphical analysis, or is it just going to be in Logger Pro that they're going to be able to do that? It's just going to be in Logger Pro. OK. And keep in mind, there are directions for being able to do it in Logger Pro also so, in our books. OK, so now I want to, uh, 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 I don't want to short stop that uh, conversation about the activity itself. But I do want to show you another tool that can kind of uh, uh, bring uh, some light to this whole uh, idea of circular motion and centripetal acceleration. And we're going to do that with uh, video, Vernier video analysis. Vernier video analysis is, uh, it's actually a, a paid application, a subscription application. Um, you can get a free 30 day trial uh, by going to our website. And you should have a link in the materials that you've downloaded uh, to be able to access a, a, a short-term uh, temporary key to uh, uh, use this tool as well. I'd encourage you, if you haven't already, to go ahead and get a, a copy of, or a, a free uh, trial of this uh, tool. So I'm going to look at starting a new experiment. And there happens to be, you can import your own video, just like a lot of our previous video analysis tools. That's really the strength of it, is to set your kids up to 
take a movie of an activity, something physically happening in the world, and analyzing that motion. Um, there are a number of built-in uh, videos, from the ever-popular basketball shot to the one we're going to look at today, which is a turntable. So we'll get that imported. Um, the first thing I like to do when I open one of these up is just to watch the video a couple of times uh, to see what's going to happen during the course of the video. And we can see we have a red dot on the turntable. Um, the, the, the title of the turntable tells us that it's uh, running at 16 RPM, not something you see too much today on turntables. But uh, And we have this nice big red dot here, which makes a really nice target for data collection. This is a, actually a good example of a video you might want to shoot in that it has a relatively simple background and a really con high contrast target that we're going to try to take advantage of. Um, the next uh, step that you would typically do in this is to set up your system. Now, for this example, I am not necessarily too interested in the setting a precise uh, distance, but I'll go ahead and, and get this set up as about uh, 40 centimeters or 0.4 meters. I'll just enter that in. The other thing I do by system setup is set the origin. And I do want to move my origin so that it's centered on the turntable. I can zoom in with my mouse. So I can place this more precisely, just kind of get it right where I want to and then zoom out. I can also, if I want to, I can rotate the axes. But for this case, I'm just going to leave it as is. Um, I noticed when I started the video that the first couple frames, it doesn't start right away. So I'm going to advance the, this a couple of frames until it's moving. And then I'm going to move this little triangle over just to uh, eliminate that uh, portion of the video where the turntable is not moving. And then I'm ready to start collecting data. I can come up here to add. And I could simply start clicking here and adding points. Now you notice that it advances uh, a point each time, a frame each time. But there are 233 frames in this video, so I don't want to necessarily uh, try to uh, look at each and every one of them. I can get rid of data points that I've added simply by grabbing them and taking them to the trash can. So let me do that to demonstrate that. There we go. So I can come down here to this gear. And I can say, I want to advance every five frames instead of marking every single frame. The other tool that's kind of nice in a high contrast video like this is this auto tracking tool. So I'm going to set this up where I'm just finding my target here. Again, I can zoom in a bit so I make sure I get this uh, centered on that circle. I can use this to kind of grab in a little bit. I can even use my arrows on my keyboard to go in and out or to move that side to side so I can get it really finely uh, tuned in there. And then the, the part that I want to look at today is this vectors tool. So we're interested in acceleration. You can look at x, y, excuse me, the, the components and the resultant vector. You can look at just the resultant, which is what we're going to be interested in. We can look at the components alone, or you can look at none of them. Again, I'm going to choose to look at the resultant. And I'm just going to click out of that. And uh, I have this set up for auto tracking. I'll start my auto tracking. And you notice that it's generating these acceleration arrows as we go, these vectors of acceleration. I'll stop my auto tracking as we get around the circle. 
Uh, this is a little messy right here, so let me open this up again. And I'm going to decrease the length of those arrows. So is there a more reasonable length there? And then I'm also going to decrease the number. So instead of every vector, it'll be every other vector. I just click out of that. I can also click out of that to eliminate the tracking tool to take a look at this. And this is just a very neat, clean way to illustrate that those that acceleration actually is a, an inward facing, a center seeking acceleration, centripetal acceleration. Um, this tool doesn't allow you to collect data, but it does allow you to, you know, to mark the data points and collect the mo and basically uh, collect position data and then calculate velocity and acceleration data from it. No sensor uh, engagement here, but kind of a nice tool to illustrate that that acceleration actually is center seeking. The last tool that I want to uh, introduce you to, we've actually been playing around with it uh, on the edges, and that's back in graphical analysis. This happens to be a graphical analysis pro. It, it's just an added feature set that uh, you can add on to graphical analysis. It is a subscription service and it gives you uh, a couple of additional features that are really quite nice. The one that I'm going to show you is this one right here. And if we have time at the end, Dave will show us another one here. But we've embedded sample experiments directly into uh, Graphical Analysis Pro that include video. So we're going to look at the same experiment that we've been working with. I'll just focus on physical near. I click back on this to get rid of the filter. And then I can scroll down through the list of physics with Vernier activities until I find uh, centripetal acceleration on a turntable part one. Um, uh, so let me, um, I'm just trying, I'll go ahead and download this. So notice that we get a video, we get a graph of the data and a data set. I can come up here to this button right here to enable replay. And I want to make sure that my video is, the sync is turned on with the data. So what we've done is we've taken a video of this data being collected, this actual data being collected. We have a video of it. And we can, uh, we've synced up the uh, timestamp on the video with the data so that as we play this, uh, close that out and just play this back. See, we have a, we, looks like our sync is a little bit off on that one. If we wanted to, we could adjust that uh, so it uh, worked out better. I actually did this where my, I linked up my data set time of 1.3 seconds and my video time of uh, 3.66 seconds. And if I just click out of that and let's uh, run through that again, see if we get a little bit better correlation. There we go, that looks a little bit better. But you can see again, okay, here's my positive acceleration as it's slowing down, here's my negative acceleration over here. So, and you can speed this up, slow it down to analyze it. You can uh, bring the movie back to this point. You can step through, uh, if we are starting from the very beginning again, and pause it, we can just step through that data and video at the same time. So it's a nice, uh, nice combination of kind of video tools built in with uh, uh, graphical analysis with actual data collected. And let me make a, a point about something here for everybody is that, you know, 
some of the videos we're seeing look jerky. That's an effect of this being a Zoom meeting, um, not the actual software. So, um, you know, when you're doing it yourself on the desktop, it's actually pretty smooth. And to, when you're broadcasting it via Zoom, eh, it, it may be a little bit jerky. So <laughs> just pointing that out. <laughs> So I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, I think uh, what I'd like to do is to stop sharing and see if there are any other questions uh, at this point. And, uh, and if, uh, if we have time, we can do a quick demonstration of some, uh, some of the other tools built into GA Pro. Doesn't appear that there's a. Well, um, what about the um, the cost of video analysis? How does that work? So video analysis. Uh, let me get my mouse in the right place so I can give you a good number rather than a, a guesstimate here. Um, and maybe you know the answer to this right off the top of your head, Dave. Uh, I think I'm it's, going to be looking it's $149 um, for, no. for a year. And, um, and, and, it, and it works in a browser. Um, so again, any of those devices uh, would run it in a, in a modern browser. Um, and it actually, um, it's browser based, but it stores the app uh, within the browser. So as long as you don't eliminate your cookies, then it will allow you to use it even offline. So initially you do have to be online and there's a way that you can um, share that uh, with your students. And so you share it with them and then they're able to, they can uh, use that too. So. so the license is a site license. So all of your science teachers and other teachers can use it and they can share it with their students uh, as well. Uh, graphical analysis, just to kind of follow that up, uh, Graphical Analysis Pro is uh, currently $69 as an introductory uh, uh, license. Um, since we've just launched this within the last couple of weeks, um, that's, uh, that's a kind of a low introductory price. Again, for, uh, uh, is, uh, now I'm saying this and I'm wondering, is it an, uh, an annual license that expires in June or is it an uh, annual license year to year? Do you know the answer off the offhand, Dave? Um, I believe it's a year-long license um, uh, for now because I know it, it's it's a new thing, so you know they've been kind of adjusting that. So uh, we may have to check on that offline. Okay. I'll tell you what, let me see if we can do that last little thing there. Um, and uh, so there is a new feature in that uh, Graphical Analysis Pro that we wanted to try to do uh, really quickly. It's called data sharing, and it actually allows you to send data from a device over the internet so that you can go to, um, you know, to another uh, graphical analysis. And so I've, I'm going to do this really quick. I'm going to switch, um, switch my camera, and what you're going to be looking at is my cell phone uh, where I am running the... Um, uh, the graphical analysis there and I've connected to a force sensor and I'm going to go and there's a little icon right here which is I want to start a um, a session and when I do this it gives a code right here that if that code is typed into um, graphical analysis on the other end of the internet uh, then we can get that so let me do this I want to um, I want to share a graphical analysis screen there. And uh, so what you're looking at is GA on my computer here. And I want to um, come here and, whoops, I've got something in my way there. There we go. And I'm going to go here and I want to type in uh, that uh, code there. And I have to look at this. It's kind of upside down for me. Uh, U X uh what t zero f f o is that what it is it's upside down for me so let me see if this works 
Oh, there we go. So what you're seeing on my computer screen is a broadcast from my phone. And so if I go here and actually hit collect and then pull on the force sensor, so I'm doing this, you see it coming out of my computer. And had you typed in that same code, uh, you too could have that data coming out there. So this is a really new feature. It was added just a few days ago. We weren't even sure if it was going to be available yet for the for the workshop. So we we didn't even put it in there yet. But uh, uh, anyway, we wanted to kind of show you that real quick there. So um, I'll, I'll uh, stop sharing that piece of it there, and then go back to to that. So were there some questions there, Tom? So there was a question about the, the GoDirect uh, acceleration sensor versus the GoDirect force and acceleration. And I was just throwing a couple notes in the, in the Q&A there. If I didn't mess that up too badly. But uh, basically, the form factor of the uh, force and acceleration sensor is just really nice for experiments where you want to, say, strap this onto a bicycle tire or uh, put it in your pocket to do some amusement park uh, physics, uh, something like that. Um, it doesn't have a force sensor attached to it. So that's a reason to have the force sensor. Um, it also has a high range accelerometer in it uh, that allows you to do uh, better collision evaluations. So you have anything to add to that, Dave? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, and uh, so I think we are out of time. Um, so I appreciate everybody coming. Um, do download that you can get a free trial of the, uh, the video analysis. You can get a free trial of the graphical analysis pro. Um, that's some of the links that you had there. So, um, and we will be doing more of these. Uh, we, and we're trying to do them kind of as, as they're timely for what you might be talking about um, in this you know, certain place in your in your courses now. So uh, I know the next one I believe is work in energy. Uh, it's coming up fairly soon and then some other topics there. So just um, be advised there'll be some more. So, so anyway, thank you for coming and we hope to see you at another one of these. <laughs>